Thank you. Can... Okay. So can everyone see the screen? I guess that's a yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm yes. getting yeses in the chat. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. So um, I thought I'll just start with, because um, Diane's asked me to um, kind of give you guys an introduction on how to write a good exam question. And I know that quite a few of you have just gone to yardsticks. Um, so they, they're they pretty good at telling everyone how to, how to write exams um, there. So um, I thought I'll go through the structures of, um, I'll focus on part ones, which I think is the main hurdle. Um, and and then um, talk quickly about part two. So I've only got about half an hour, about 25 minutes now, actually. So um, yeah, so the part one exam structure, as you all know, is 20 cases. And um, usually, I think there are about three to four cases with differentials in them, um, whereas the rest of them are mostly spot diagnoses. Um, the exam is four hours and now is digital, whereas um, when I did it, it was still with slides. But I think it's still really useful to go through like for our edges here, I tell them to go through as many slides as they can and then just transfer those skills um, to digital. Um, so from my point of view, I finished um, in November um, last year and um, how the way that I try to study um, and pass the first time round is um, to do a system based type of um, studying. And um, I normally start probably a year beforehand in June um, and so I'll start off in June and then do a system base and um, try and go through a couple of systems per month and even if you don't get through everything because PATH is massive and you will never get through everything you need to move on to the next system so that you get as much good coverage as possible because the part one um, exam knowledge is actually really big compared to when you first start with PATH when you know basically nothing um, you need to do a lot of mock exams um, because the whole thing really is also not only testing your knowledge, but how you present yourself as a candidate through, you know, the 20 questions on paper and it's still a written exam. So it actually takes quite a lot of practice to be able to write um, cohesively and kind of coherently, sorry, coherently um, on, on the day when you're really a bit panicked and a little bit nervous. Um, so lots of practices would be helpful with that. Um, here, I think we do at least 20 mock exam practices before they actually do their part ones. Um, and it will be a good idea to maybe set up part one, you know, just collect some slides and like make up mock exams for each other. Um, you can't know everything for PATH. So you need to try and study smarter. And to do that, you kind of what I did was I looked through previous exam entities and try and pick out um, college exam favorites. And you do find that the same things come up time and time again that they, the college really likes to test people on. Um, and then you got to make sure that maybe if you, you know, write up a list of everything that has been previous favorites. And when you look through them, you know immediately that you know exactly what that is. And um, you can write a good answer for those ones. And that's all the spots. So optical mileage, again, lots of glass. Um, you need to do lots of reporting um, because from just doing lots of general reporting, that gets you quite comfortable with just day-to-day -day things. And sometimes they do throw in, especially things like endometriums and things, um, like normal endometriums. If you haven't seen any like um, or not enough on the day, that could really throw you. Um, and then, like I said before, like once you've done lots of glass, because most places have lots of glass slides and you can transfer that to digital and you know that the RCPA has lots of QAP slides that you can do and um, I'll encourage you to do all of them before the exam. So in terms of timing um, that's really crucial I find during the exam that you've only got four hours and that sounds like a lot but with 20 cases um, that only really is around 11 minutes per, per case and I tell the regis here um, to go through, um, you know, just when you're starting your exam, go through each of the slides very quickly and just spend a minute per slide so that your brain has already clocked, you know, and gone through the 20 slides right at the beginning. And your brain's already clocked, you know, like, oh, this is, um, 
I don't know, like a spindle cell tumor and that needs a bit more time, I'll move on. And then what I used to do is I used to do all five spots first and then whatever I have left, like the three or four differentials or things that I find difficult, I'll divide whatever time I've got left with those for those difficult cases. But you need to make sure that with each case, you don't go past your 11 minutes um, and you've got to write legibly because the examiners get a bit fed up when they're looking at so many different examinations and they can't read your writing. So they they tend to be you know, less forgiving if they can't read what you're writing anyway, even if it might be right. So um, the format of each of the exams for the spot diagnoses, um, you really need to just put a very short description, like three to four lines for uncomplicated cases, and then write your diagnosis. And the comments really like, you know, you you write in comments to show off knowledge. And that's not really for passing that question per se, but these examinations are not a pass and fail um, all the time. So sometimes there'll be a borderline and the examiners then would want to look at your entire paper to see what kind of candidate you are overall. So, and, and that, you know, with differentials as well, that's really a way for you to shine so in the differentials, you have your description and then um, you have what I do is I have a summary. So you either have like a small round blue cell tumor or spindle cell neoplasm. And then you have a differential um, where you have, you know, five maximum differentials. And then you need to really clearly number and underline your preferred diagnosis. Um, and then you go through your plan, which is what I've based. Like I went to yard six, maybe three, four times. Um, and learn how to write um, exams. And normally with my plan, um, I go through the clinical correlations and then radiology and then special stains and any sections. And then I do my immunohistochemistry stains where table is often preferable. Um, then you go for all your other molecular and then synoptic reports and then your MDTs will ref refer to your colleagues. But um, I wouldn't write that for every slide. That's only for some very special occasions. Um, you need to tell the examiners that you understand the pathology and that your plan can get you to the right diagnosis. So you can't just write the IHC without actually writing what you expect to find for each of the diagnoses. Um, if they read it and they can't actually get you to the right answer from reading your exams, then you won't pass that question. And try and also use the correct terminology as per WHO. Um, yeah. So. I got some cases to try and show you. Um, this is a 77 year old parotid. I don't know who's on the, uh, who's on, but does someone want to have a go at this? Um, Roshni, I recognize your, um, I recognize your um, name. Because I think you're coming down to see us. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't mean to pick on you, but like, it's just, it's, I haven't actually done many of these um, talks because normally I just do a multi-head se session with our regs here. Uh, so do you want to have a go at this case? Sure. I've just got to share my screen again. New share. Right. Can you see that? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Here. Can you see that now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is a parotid. Yes. Uh, so yeah, as I would say sections show salivary gland tumor, um, which is, I, I suppose it's, it's composed of uh, predominantly serous uh, glands. So in keeping with a, uh, with a parotid, um, it contains an encapsulated tumor. Mm -hmm. um, which is made up of uh, with, with a generalized lobular appearance and 
areas of uh, lymphoid aggregates. Yeah. Um, looking clo a bit more closely, uh, the cells seem to um, be composed of, uh, sorry, taking a while to, um, okay. Uh, polygonal cells with um, abundant uh, eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm. Um, uh, I suppose slightly eccentrically placed uh, nuclei with prominent nucleoli. Um, yep, so you got a diagnosis? Um, I was wondering if this was an acinic cell um, tumor. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll just go back to acinic cell carcinoma. Sorry. Yeah. So this is how I would write this case. Um, and that was really good, Roshni. Thank you. Um, so I'll just use three to four lines of description, and then you write your different, uh, you write your diagnosis. So this is a spot, um, and then you plus minus a comment, you know, about the differential of the um, secretory cell carcinoma. So that was good. Done. I, I'm just going to um, butt in here. Yeah. I just want to emphasize what what Ling's saying here. Because at the moment, I'm giving you 15 slides every week in a test format. And it's really, really important that you do this, that you actually write them out. And I know that most of you don't because you're usually busy and not taking the time. But this is your exam prep. And Ling's given a wonderful example of what to do here. And one thing that I want to uh, do is get it so that we can swap and self-mark our, um, our writing. So uh, please, please, when you're doing it, write them up like this. This is a great example of what I'm expecting you to do. Cool, right. So thanks, Diane. Yeah, that's really important because I find that with our regs here as well, um, it's really it's really important for you guys to actually like part. I would say actually fifty percent of trying to pass the exam is to get the skills of being able to write in a really kind of like you know um, legibly in a actually a really like timely fashion. So when like for part ones especially, I feel like you need to get to a stage where as soon as you put the slide onto or as soon as you see the slide on the screen, you need to know exactly what it is for a spot exam in order to have enough time to write that um, that diagnosis out. And you need to know as soon as you put the slide on that, oh yeah, that's a spindle cell neoplasm and that will be a differential. Um, I'll put that aside and do the other um, slides, the other spots first, because otherwise you, you're not gonna be able to finish. Um, and you know, to be able to do that, you need lots and lots of practice of writing things out. So this is the second case, um, which is a 64 year old female right hemi for appendiceal mass. Um, this is a differential case. So um, I, I don't know, I don't know many of you, are you mostly from, um, from Wellington and doing part ones? I know that, I know that Paola, I know Paola. Paola, do you wanna do this one? Okay, hi. Hi, hi, how are you? Oh, good, nice to hear from you. Yeah, nice to hear from you too. <laughs> so, um, do you mind doing this one, Paolo? Is that okay? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Okay, <laughs> cool. Right, so this is an appendiceal mass. Mm -hmm. um, this is trickier, so I wouldn't, it's okay if you don't, like, and it's horrible being put on the spot, but it just makes this a bit more interactive. Let's um, go <laughs> so, I've got to just share the proper screen. <coughs> Can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. It always goes a bit too high power, even though I'm on a two times. So I'll try and... Um, okay. <coughs> You've got your meso appendix here. Yeah. And then so some appendiceal. 
Yeah, it's just like it's a transverse sections of the appendix wall. Uh, you can see it's a lot of um, the epithelium looks a little bit hyperplastic um, uh, with maybe a lot of mucin, interested plasmic mucin. Um, you still have some lamina propria with some lymphoid aggregates. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at this power, I guess I'm looking for some kind of low grade dysplasia in the epithelium or high grade dysplasia. Um, it's a very thickened uh, muscle wall. Um, It's a lot of inflammatory infiltrate um, that could be just related to maybe a, a background of appendicitis. Um, some macrophages as well, I believe. Is there any um, emotional low, very low power that can see the lumen in the relationship with the muscle wall, please, Lynn? Yeah, this is the lowest I can go. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> this so um, this is a this is a a two diagnoses slide, oh. which is why it's a bit tricky. All right. Um, so that's the petty. Um, so in areas you see that the, the appendix um, mucosa doesn't have a lymphoid aggregate. It's more like a, a atrophic. Uh, and yeah. There. So, so what do you think is going on in the appendix here? The, but that makes me think. Um, in series that comes to normal to abnormal. So that makes me think about low gray appendix amusinous neoplasia. Yeah, good. Towards the area that is um, yeah. with info aggregates. Um, I'm looking for there for low gray or high gray dysplasia or any possible adenocarcinoma that can be associated to that. Yeah. Um, I need to look for extra um, for musing. Um, yeah like extra facetic mucin and things. And then this is actually yeah. another tumor, yeah. probably a bit tricky to see. Mm -hmm. And it, um, mm, it's a lot of inflammatory background, so it's quite hard. It's like a little bit spindle cell here, is it? Yeah, good. Yeah. So oh, that's all you. That's all I kind of wanted mm -hmm. you to get to. I don't want you to mm -hmm. go any further than that because it's hard to see on the screen, but mm -hmm. this is another spindle cell neoplasm. So you've got two things going on here and yeah. I kind of just wanted to like show you, this is a part two case. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to show you how you would try and write this one up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, with the the glow at the moment for what you have shown me, I will go for a low grade appendicitis using the neoplasia, yeah. and I will try to uh, work out this spindle cell proliferation under the muscle layer. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Suppose I need some That's history as well. Let's just say it's a female, so I'm not sure it could be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. So um, this is how I would write it up. So I wrote a bit more for this one, you know, about six lines because there's two things going on and you want to like try and look for all of your positives um, instead of writing a really long waffly description. And then how I would try and approach this is I'll put a summary on and my summary would be a spindle cell neoplasm and I've decided that it looked low grade with benign features. And then my second is an appendiceal low grade mucinous neoplasm because from this slide, I can't see any evidence of invasion. So I would just base it on this slide, okay? And then, um, then I'll go on to putting my differentials of a spindle cell tumor. And my um, first one would be an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor because of all of the, when you actually can see the slide, you, you'll see all of the different like plasma cells. And like you said, there was lots of inflammatory inflammation and then you just go through your other um, spindle cell uh, differentials of that location and here it will be a GIS, a schwannoma, a leiomyoma, an IgG4, sclerosing disease and a fibromatosis and then I go through with my plan and the plan like I said before is just to try and show the examiners that even if your inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is not the right diagnosis you can get to the right one through your discussion so with your clinical details um, and the radiology, and then you um, talk about what you find in blood, especially with IgG4. And then you will say, talk about further sections um, and submitting the entire appendix because you've shown the examiners that, yep, I know that I have to submit the entire appendix, make sure that I need to rule out any evidence of invasion. 
um, and then also off the spindle cell lesion um, to make sure that you rule out any malignant features. And then you request immunos that will help you find out um, what kind of tumor this is. And this is a table that I would then put on to my exam. Um, and you know, I've outlined all of that. And then lastly, you would consider the ALK molecular rearrangement to confirm. Um, obviously that will change if you think it's a GIST, then you know, you then do your SDH and um, talk about the CD117 and the and the CKIT um, mutations. But in this case, because I'm I'm favoring an IMFT. And when I'm actually looking at the slide, I've already decided that it's an IMFT. And you're just really writing out all of these other differentials to show the examiners that you know you know your stuff, basically. Um, and then for me, I would always write right at the bottom of what I still favor and underline that on top of doing that in my differential. But that's just my preference to make sure that they know that this is what I think. Okay, so um, I, yeah, I, so I, I thought about um, some other differentials. Um, if you want to have a look, go through a couple very quickly, which sometimes can be tricky in the exam to write up. Um, I don't know anybody else um, apart from you two. So does anyone else want to have a go at this next one? I think I'm going to uh, nominate uh, Louisa. Okay. Louisa, is your microphone working? Hello. Hello. You, yep. So Hi. Louisa, Louisa's just she's just in second year at the moment. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. Right. So Louisa, this is a right neck lymph node. of a 41-year-old female. And you can go ahead and just, I'll right. show you around a bit. Um, gosh. There's no pressure, like it doesn't matter. If you get it <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, so what looked like an encapsulated lymph node with lots of kind of fibrotic sclerotic stuff Good. as well. Yeah. And then there's large uh, lobules of more cellular areas that are quite well circumscribed mm -hmm. um, that don't look like normal lymph node. Good. So you say section shows lymph node whose underlying architecture has been effaced. Yep. Okay. And now going in closer it looks like there are uh, regions of greater cellularity mm -hmm. and lesser cellularity of small round cells um okay <laughs> <laughs> clearly not enough coffee this morning <laughs> Um, what do you think of these cells here? Uh, kind of they look kind of larger, atypical, myeloid, yeah, pleomorphic yep. cells, yep. Good. which have got more abundant cytoplasm. Yep, and very prominent nucleoli. Yep, and then you've got, like you said, lots of sclerosis and a bit of necrosis. So there's there's no normal architecture left in here. And this is an exam favorite because this is one of those lymphomas that you can diagnose um, on an H&E, almost. Um, have you got any idea what it might be? Um, because of the, uh, would it be like a follicular lymphoma? Just with the uh, Yeah, I can see why you said that because it looks like it's quite lobulated. But follicular lymphomas wouldn't have these really big cells. And just before, the bilobe would be uh, consistent with the reed Stoneberg cell. Right. Oh, right. So, okay. yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah. So this is a classic, classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And as you know, Hodgkin lymphomas have 
um, different patterns. Okay. So how I would write this would be um, you again spend three lines, four lines of writing section shows lymph node um, with whose underlying architecture has been a phase by a proliferation of um, neopl neoplastic and large atypical cells showing bilobe nuclei consistent with Reg Sternberg and Hodgkin cells um, on the background of um, inflammatory cells, because that's what you would expect to find, and um, a mix with um, sclerosis. Okay, and then um, with classic Hodgkin's, your differential would be this. This is another lymph node of a 25 year old. Um, this is actually from the FNA clinic in a thigh. Um, and again, you've got big cells um, on the background of lymphocytes. You see all the big cells there with prominent nucleoli. And um, this is a um, lymphocyte predominant um, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin, which um, you probably know is actually a B cell rich, like sort of like a B cell rich B cell lymphoma. And it's not, it doesn't mark like a Hodgkin, but this is definitely in differential. Um, I'm hoping that in part ones, they won't give you something like this, but if you want to show off, then like you can say, well, I favor a classic Hodgkin. My differential would be a nodular um, lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin. And then um, you would again, go through your plan with clinical details and then um, your, you know, extra sec sections. I, I, I do lymphomas, so I really like having thin sections, which is what this one is, where I can see the nuclear details much better. And then um, I'll go through my flow cytometry um, for lymphomas. That's something you have to try and mention if you can remember. And what would you find in flow, Louisa, for Hodgkin, do you know? I don't know. No, so it's just um, it, the, the large cells don't gate, so then normally you just get a polyclonal, you, you won't get a clonal population. So that's something that you should mention in a Hodgkin. And then um, you go for your IHC, so then your large cells will be CD15, CD30 positive, um, whereas your um, nodular lymphocyte predominant, that would be negative. And um, Hodgkin is B-cell crippled, so your CD20 should, shouldn't be staining strongly um, or at all with the large cells. Um, yeah, I didn't write up the examples of this one. I just thought I'll just talk through it. And then the last example that I was going to show you, who wants to do this one? Is Alpha still there? Alpha, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll have a go. <laughs> you want to do this one? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, right. Yep. Um, actually, I've got two other ones for first years. Um, so we'll do this one quickly, Alpha. Yep. Okay, this is a 45 year old um, left frontal lobe lesion, rim enhancing. Okay. Okay. So, I would say sections show brain. Yep. In which there are areas of increased cellularity. Uh, yes, um, which comprises a neoplastic population of uh, pleomorphic uh, discohesive um, glial cells with abundant um, eosinophilic cytoplasm. Right. And then I would be looking and they see microvascular associated with microvascular proliferation and then I'll look for necrosis. And yeah. I would um, summary um, high grade glial neoplasm favor glioblastoma multiforme with a differential of um, oligodendroglioma glate three. Mm -hmm. And I would do the IDH. Um, mutation and the ATRX. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's really great. So yeah, cool. like the summary for this one, what um, would be a high grade glioma. And um, as you 
probably know last year WHO changed the um, glioma classifications. So he is 45. So um, the likelihood of him having an IDH positive um, glioma grade four um, it's higher than an IDH negative glioblastoma. So you can you can you can't call an IDH positive grade four a glioblastoma anymore. So I don't know whether the the college would expect you to you know whether they'll still mark you as correct if you just put glioblastoma um, for these kind of cases, or whether you you should specify that this is a high grade glioma grade four with microvascular um, proliferation and necrosis. Um, my differential would be an IDH positive. Um, astrocytoma grade four or an IDH negative like IDH wild type glioblastoma and again like you said alpha yep so the oligo um, grade three would come into this differential as well um, so and then you need to just go through your um, IDH one um, and your atrix which should be lost in the astrocytoma and retained in an oligo um, yeah so Okay, so we've just got last two. Um, are there any part one or like um, first years or anyone? I don't know any of you. Um, Tarek? 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 Yes, hi. I'm hi. in first year in hi. Wellington. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, nice sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you want to have a go at this one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this is a 40 year old. Do you know, can you tell us what we are? It looks like testes. Testes, yeah, perfect, testes. great. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so we have testes. Yep. Um, and I think I see sort of a fairly well circumscribed lesion. Mm -hmm. um, and this palette looks like sort of um, almost sort of broad cords or islands. And um, we have these sort of um, purple, um, sort of monotonous population of cells um, separated with fibrostroma. Yeah, um, very good. And looks <clears throat> um, sort of fairly uniform. Um, I think those are possibly, I saw some tubules go past with maybe that's <clears> germs <throat> of neoplasia in situ, but have to have yeah. a closer look. Um, Normally you would find some in this entity, right? Yeah, I think this yeah. is a seminoma. Yeah, um, great. Perfect. Um, that, but that's what it is. Obviously, yep. Yeah. And you do maybe a talk about like it could be part of a mixture of cell tumor. So you have to sample the testis yep. um, well um, and obviously correlate with like serum um, like AFP and HCG as well. Yeah, perfect, good. Yeah. So that will be in your comment, but this, just based on this slide, would yeah. be a pure seminoma, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just do your description, three lines, you do your diagnosis, seminoma, and then like that would pass that, you know, you would pass yeah. this slide. And then you want to show off by writing a comment of what you just said, like I would, you know, thoroughly, um, sample the rest of the tumor for mixed yeah. germ cell tumor, like you said, and then I also look at the serum um, for for um, increased markers. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's perfect. Great, great job. Right. Thank you. And then this is the last one. I won't pick on anyone. And again, actually, someone else should do this one. Um, Christy, are you in Wellington? Hello, I'm in Hi, sorry, where are you? Uh, sorry, I'm just in a shared room, so there might be a lot of background noise. Um, oh, all right. sorry, I are you apologize. in Wellington or are you in? I'm in Auckland. Oh, in Auckland. Okay, cool. All right. Yep. Are you doing your part ones? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Well, do you want to have a go at this one? This is a 24 year old. Again, a mass, um, a testicular mass. Okay. So um, in this power, I can see multiple cystic spaces um, with the fibrous um, sort of septi. Mm -hmm. um, and the cystic spaces um, are aligned by 
sorry, I can't really see the lining, um, but um, the septae has got some inflammatory infiltrate. Yeah. Um, looks like mucin um, and a mucinous epithelium probably um, at this power. Sorry, I can't really see. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it, on, on the screen? Um, um, and there is like almost like a cartilaginous metaplasia or element there. Yeah. Um, almost looks like a, it's trying to be a teratoma. Um, so we've yeah. got multiple elements. Um, we've got possibly a GI epithelium, a cartilage. Yeah. And um, I, from my understanding, if you have um, a testis teratoma, it's considered um, malignant, is yep. that right? Yep. Um, and the age of this patient was was it an older patient, post pubertal? Twenty four. He's only twenty four. Oh, right. right. Okay. So it's post pubertal. Um, yeah. And would you would you just say that would you just say that this is a teratoma? Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is a teratoma, and then. Um, so, and then from this slide here, like it's hard to show you everything. Like, what would you look for to, for any sort of teratomas? Well, as far as I know, you would look for immature sort of um, elements like neuroepithelial yeah. elements. Um, you would also look for a mixed component uh, yeah. if there is. Um, so you could sample the testis a bit more widely um, to look for that. Yeah. Uh, and you would also make, I mentioned the percentage of the, um, different components uh, yeah. of the tumor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So that's what like. So again, you'll go back to your spot, and then you just do um, the very basic description of this slide, and then what you think the diagnosis is, and then your comment of what you've just said of sampling more widely, looking for immature elements, um, and then again like with the previous one that Tarek did, um, you know, look, looking for any clinical um, beta-HCG or any alpha feeder proteins for other elements um, that will alert you to say like a choriocarcinoma. But in this section, you can't see any of that. Um, so the last two cases are spots and they should take you no more than 11 minutes. Um, and yeah, that's all the cases for today. I totally ran over time anyway. Um, yes, okay. So, um, yeah, like Diane said, you need to keep practicing and really try and write those things out um, um, and, and really set yourself a four hour limit to write out an exam, like at least, I think, 10 times properly um, before you try and sit the exam in May. Um, because you need to really get used to doing that because during the day, it, it, it is quite nerve wracking from my experience anyway. Um, so yeah, you want to get as much practice in as possible. Okay. Thank you so much, Ling. That was right. such good advice. Okay. Um, and uh, would people like to show their appreciation in the chat, please? Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you, Ling. That was great. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Good luck. Thank you Ling. so much. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ling. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.